Good afternoon. We are um, uh, beginning our uh, webinar on TBI and the elderly, which is a very interesting topic and very important because of the changes in the epidemiology of TBI. Um, and I'm, I'm sharing this webinar uh, with uh, very young people, uh, people from uh, the section of neurotrauma um, um, that are uh, intensively working uh, in this field uh, of neurotrauma and neurotrauma in the elderly. Um, uh, I'm sharing the, the webinar with Rebecca Gabriela, who is a, a PhD student from Leuven University, Ana Maria Castaño, who works in, in Hospital de Fertura, she's a neurosurgeon, Thomas Van Essen, who is also a neurosurgeon from um, um, Leiden University Medical Center and, and The Hague, uh, and Alexander Josie, who is a, 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 also a neurosurgeon and his, his daughter. <laughs> uh, and we are, we are going to begin with uh, some introduction uh, on, uh, on TBI and elderly, uh, which I'm going to present, and some data on uh, a survey that we have been conducting in, in, uh, in the neurotrauma, uh, in the neurotrauma section of the European Association of Neurological Surgeons. I'm going to share my, my screen now uh, to begin with the presentation. Okay. So I am I'm Alfonso Lagares. I work in Hospital de Octubre in Madrid. Uh, and, and I'm going to talk about TBI and the allergy, the general aspects. Uh, I have to give first a disclosure. I, I, am, I, I, I belong to a group of uh, international uh, cooperation uh, regarding the, the development of blood biomarkers uh, to improve management of mild traumatic brain injury. Uh, we have now two studies going on uh, uh, with, uh, uh, supported by the European Union. And we hope to have uh, positive uh, findings uh, very soon. I, I will talk some a little, a little bit about these, these two studies. Um, I'm going to try to introduce the subject with an introduction. I'm going to, to talk about what is different and what we see differently by means of this uh, uh, neurotrauma section uh, survey in which, we, uh, in which 95 participants have uh, included uh, results, um, uh, 34 from Europe, uh, 14 from the trauma section, and a big participation from, the, from our partner, the Society of Neurological Surgeons in Spain, the SENEC, uh, who, have, uh, who have participated very, very uh, eagerly in this survey. And I will try to give some conclusions. Well, the, the population changes as life expectancy grows. And as you see in this graph, a uh, uh, population over 60 uh, years of age is increasing and will be uh, uh, very important uh, in, by 2050, more than 30% of the population in developed countries will be over 60. And so we can say that the world is getting older and so TBI. The incidence of TBI is, is changing and, and it's, it varies widely in the different countries because of differences in, in reporting. But we can say that it's about 300 uh, patients per 100,000 inhabitants per year in the European Union. And this, uh, this epidemiology is changing uh, everywhere in the world as we see that uh, most uh, uh, TBI is concentrated uh, in uh, patients over 60 years of age, both in mild TBI and moderate and severe TBI. So really as the as population is uh, increasingly aging, we are uh, going to have an increasing problem uh, with uh, patients having TBI being uh, elderly and being uh, older and older. We've seen this in Spain. There are ch having changes in the epidemiology in our hospital. We began having uh, uh, in the in the 80s and 90s having a very young population, and uh, really uh, uh, um, the ages in which in which uh, the TBI was concentrated was around uh, 20 uh, and 30s. But now we have uh, more and more patients uh, uh, with uh, uh, being over uh, 65. And, and that uh, uh, determines that the most frequent cause worldwide is falls, uh, falls from modern height. And, and in some countries, uh, even in Central Europe, uh, this uh, cause of TBI is the most frequent. Uh, so really, uh, um, TBI in the elderly and falling from one side is a real problem. And, and it's one of the uh, major uh, uh, consultations uh, in the emergency department. So one point of discussion is really, what is the age limit to determine that a patient is elderly? And this has been treated by different specialities. And for instance, in the orthopedic uh, world, there has been uh, some reports regarding uh, the, the heterogeneity of the definition of elderly age uh, in their research. 
And you see that the most frequent age uh, uh, reported as, as elderly it has been uh, uh, 65 years of age. However, when our section uh, developed this survey uh, and we asked about when do we consider a patient to be an elderly patient, uh, we found that most uh, people uh, responded that, uh, uh, that that age was 75. And you see that most uh, uh, responders were over the age uh, of 70. Um, what is different in, in TBI in the elderly? Really the mechanisms. Uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, we, as we age, we drive less motorbikes, we have uh, less uh, uh, quarrels, and we have uh, more frequently uh, falling uh, from our high, own height or running over by a car or by a bicycle. So, we, uh, so the mechanism is completely different. And that makes uh, uh, then with a more fragile brain to have a completely different picture regarding the clinical pathological uh, of, of the TBI, the clinical pathology of the TBI. So we have more contusions and subdurals in the, in the elderly uh, and less, of course, less fractures and less epidurals. Um, uh, also, uh, uh, the, the condition of the patient is completely different. Uh, elderly patients have more frequently uh, premorbid conditions and medications. Uh, most, uh, many patients are anticoagulated because of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the more frequent, uh, and the more frequency of uh, atrial fibrillation, and, and also their baseline function is, is worse. So we try to determine to assess in our survey uh, whether uh, frailty or comorbidities affected the definition of, elderly, of, of the age of being elderly uh, in, in our survey. So, and, and, we, and we, uh, we saw that most uh, uh, responders said that yes, that uh, premorbid condition really affected the age in which uh, uh, their patients, uh, one could consider a patient elderly or not. And of course, being uh, elderly, uh, being with comorbidity decreases the age um, 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 and being without comorbidity increases the age. So um, um, patients without comorbidity, we could consider uh, elderly uh, beginning at 75 and with comorbidity beginning uh, uh, most, more frequently at 70 or 65. We also asked uh, what relative importance had different comorbidities in the definition of elderly. And we can see in the graph that uh, the most important factors that are important for the definition of elderly are really the functional status and comorbidities that affect functional status. And you see that the most important uh, is our, our cardiovascular disease of con or cognitive status because this, this really affects uh, the functional status of the patient. Of course, clinical di assessment uh, diagnosis is more difficult in the elderly because GCS may be difficult to apply when the patient uh, is, cognitive, uh, is cognitively impaired. And, and GCS in the age may underestimate the extent and severity of the injury because many patients with mild TBI uh, and, uh, and less, uh, less severe TBI can, uh, can have uh, uh, big lesions in the CT uh, because they can cope with uh, mass lesions that are uh, that have more volume than, than young patients. And um, that makes difficult to, to assess uh, the, the severity of the trauma just by the GCS. Biomarkers could help us doing that, assessing the, TBI, the, the severity of the TBI, but there are, there are doubts regarding the, the validity of their assessment in the elderly because uh, uh, the, the normal levels of these biomarkers could rise in, in the elderly. And there are reports regarding a decreased specificity of, this, of these biomarkers uh, in elderly patients. And so uh, uh, and a specific study on the elderly is needed. And, and uh, when asked about the importance of these uh, factors, uh, uh, the, the responders, the, the, the survey responders were uh, also very, they, they thought they were very important. And uh, this is the training of GC, uh, on, on GCS assessment or the inclusion of, of different scales, like frailty scales, while uh, um, assessing TBI in the elderly. And of course, the use of biomarkers is also interesting for the, for the responders. Uh, regarding uh, biomarkers, uh, um, uh, you know that in, now in Europe, there are different studies regarding biomarkers in mild TBI, and this is one of, of, the, of them, BRAINY2, which tries to uh, um, use these biomarkers to improve diagnosis and, and management in patients, uh, uh, in vulnerable patients with mild TBI. And there is a multi-center prospective clinical study focused uh, on elderly patients going on now uh, in Europe and including patients. 
There are also general management uh, differences. There are difficulties in assessing severity, which could lead to difficulties in triage and transfer policies between centers. And of course, uh, there is the, also the, the debate about using or not uh, 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 being old over 65 as a, as a risk factor for lesionings in the, uh, uh, after mild TBI, and of course being a, a factor to indicate a, a CT scan uh, uh, for the assessment of this pathology. We made a, a survey uh, uh, this, uh, in, inside Brainy One study and with the help of some of the, of, of the neurotrauma section group, uh, trying to um, uh, assess the variability indication, indication of brain CT scan after mild TBI uh, um, in different countries, in France, Greece, Portugal, and Spain. And you see that uh, uh, although there is quite an agreement uh, of using uh, as a risk factor anticoagulation, platinum inhibitors or full antithrombotic treatment, there is a, a wide variability in the use of uh, the age over 60 years of age as a, fast, as a factor for, uh, for asking for a CT after mild TBI. And this was also uh, uh, pro proven in a, in a uh, um, um, letting them uh, assess a, um, a case in which an 80-year-old 80, 80 woman was taken to the emergency, emergency room after falling. And that was the case with no other risk factor. And as you see, most people, most physicians in Portugal and many in Greece and Spain would ask uh, a CT for that patient. But in France, the, the, the rate of, of, of indication of, of a CT was uh, very, very small. So there is a wide variability really in the use of CT after mild TBI in this population. So uh, we also try to uh, uh, answer this question about the variability in the use of CT after mild TBI uh, using age as a, as a factor. And you see that uh, although the most frequent uh, answer was that they wouldn't uh, use CT uh, uh, with just this factor, there are still a lot of uh, physicians that would strongly agree or moderately agree or agree uh, or at least agree of using CT scan uh, uh, in this indication. Um, there is also wide variability in repeating or not repeating uh, a CT on a patient uh, with normal CT, but being on antithrombotic treatment or being on, on new anticoagulants. You see that uh, there is uh, quite a variability in determining in, if, if physicians would repeat or not repeat a CT after a normal CT in this population, or even uh, after minor findings. You see that. Uh, if new symptoms develop, or if patients are warfaring, or or uh, or if, if patients have any other factor, really they they would uh, uh, most physicians would ask for a, for another CT uh, if the CT would be pathological. But there are still uh, physicians that uh, are in doubt of repeating or not repeating uh, a CT after minor findings. There are also differences in ICU admission policies. And there is also a, a, a doubt regarding the, the use of IC, ICP monitoring or limitation of therapy uh, in this population. And as you see in this, in this study, there is, a, there is a, um, an increase in, uh, in, uh, in nihilism, in non-treatment of these patients, uh, and, and the intensity of treatment uh, is reduced in patients over, over 65 years of age. So uh, we asked uh, specifically about uh, the use of uh, ICP monitoring in these patients, in patients, in elderly patients. And, and we asked if, if uh, physicians were uh, in agreement or disagreement with the statement that the elderly patients can suffer from high intracranial pressure and therefore ICP monitoring should be indicated in a case-by-case -case basis. And, I and we feel that most uh, responders uh, agreed uh, to this statement. So really, uh, in, their, in their belief is that uh, assessment has to be done in a case-by-case -case, uh, uh, basis and treatment should not be, or monitoring should not be uh, um, um, rejected in this, uh, in this population. Regarding specific indications, uh, uh, regarding uh, most physicians will not monitor a normal CT, but when there is a, the presence of any lesion, like any mass lesion, or interventricular hemorrhage or subranal hemorrhage or any abnormality or cisternal compression, most physicians would uh, indicate the, the use or would uh, go for, for monitoring uh, ICP. Though, um, um, though there, there are uh, also variations and some of them would not use uh, ICP monitoring in, this, uh, in these patients. 
this is quite interesting, the, 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 the use of uh, the CPP management. Uh, you see that uh, there is uh, uh, quite uh, a variability and most, uh, and most physicians would um, um, be neutral regarding this, uh, this, uh, the use of CPP management that would include target perfusion pressures in this population. You see that, uh, and, this, and this is really, I think, because uh, in many countries, uh, uh, this management is not performed uh, directly by neurosurgeons. Uh, this is, uh, 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 we just set the, the monitoring and this management is, uh, is uh, really uh, um, taken by uh, ICU physicians. But um, uh, we, are, we think we agree that the management should be in a case-by-case -case basis and maybe uh, sometimes uh, a CPP should be higher than younger, than younger population. Regarding uh, the, the end of treatment or the, with the, the withholding of, of, of treatment and, or withdrawing life-sustaining treatments, um, we try to assess the differences regarding the, which, was, which was the most important factor uh, regarding um, um, uh, the decision-making. So um, um, it seems that in Europe, most countries would uh, uh, determine that the most important factor is for the physician is comorbidity and frailty of status, and then prognosis of the individual lesion. So these two factors really play an important role in deciding whether to withdraw or not treatment. Um, and then the personal desire is also the third, the third one, and age by itself or, fa or family opinion are less important in, the, in these decisions. So really comorbidity, frailty of status, prognosis, and personal desire are the most important factors for deciding whether or not to withhold or withdraw life-sustaining treatments. Regarding uh, surgical treatment, there are general management differences, of course. There, are, there is a double prejudice against surgery, and we will talk about this in the, in the webinar. You see that the age, age is normal, normally commonly viewed as a factor of increased risk, surger, uh, risk uh, 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 surgical risk, and also is a factor of increased risk of poor, poor outcomes. So we normally act in a very um, um, conservative way in these patients because there is a risky a surgery is a risky business in this population, uh, and and you see in this in this very very uh, good uh, study from Center TVI and that age was a, a very important factor designing surgery uh, in in any in 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 TBI population. So we asked specifically in the survey whether there is an, there was an age limit for craniotomy or a primary decompressive craniectomy. And you see that there is a wide variability in the responses uh, going from 60 to no limit that was uh, set at 100 years. So that was the, uh, the answer. 100 years was patient that, uh, physicians that thought that was, there was no age limit. And you see that there is an age limit around 80 for craniotomy and a little bit less for primary decompressive craniotomy. Uh, but this changes uh, uh, regarding uh, the country and inside the country. As you see, Spanish neurosurgeons are less prone to operate. They have a, a lower uh, age uh, limit for uh, um, craniotomy and uh, craniectomy. Uh, then, for example, for instance, the, 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 uh, the, the trauma section responders who were very optimistic about performing craniotomies or craniectomies in the elderly and, and, neurosurgeons, and neurosurgeons from around Europe. So really, as, as to conclude, uh, the incidence of TBI in age of people will be grow, uh, will grow in problem worldwide. Uh, there are specificities regarding this population which should be taken into consideration. And there are areas of agreement, but also uh, of disagreement in Europe. And so uh, in, the, in the section, we are planning with, uh, with the help of this survey to design uh, um, a specific consensus statement in different areas. And we are planning to, to perform a Delphi uh, study uh, and, and in, this, uh, this, uh, in this way to try to, to get some agreements uh, and to have some conclusions to help uh, physicians uh, around Europe. And you will hear about this uh, very soon. So I'm going to introduce the next speaker now. I'm going to look, uh, finish my presentation. And let me see. Uh, if I can do it, 
if not, I will have, have to, uh, okay. Okay. So just to, to help you uh, uh, outside the webinar, you can, uh, you can use the chat to, to set your questions and we will try to answer them at the end. And I'm going to introduce Rebecca uh, uh, Gabriela, who is a PhD student in, in, in Leuven University uh, and Leuven Hospital. And uh, she will present us uh, their experience in Leuven with uh, TBI in the age. Please, Rebecca. Thank you, Alfonso, for the introduction. Um, I'm going to present my screen. I think you should be seeing it now. Okay, perfect. So, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm a PhD student at KU Leuven, and the main goal of my PhD is to investigate the impact that traumatic brain injury has on elderly patients. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, we have already seen that the incidence and prevalence of elderly has been increasing a lot in the last decades, mainly due to fall accidents in this population. And yeah, we have we also know that injury patterns, clinical management, and outcomes in this elderly population is different from the patterns we see in younger patients. So that's what I'm trying to better understand with my PhD. And in order to achieve this goal of better understanding these facts, um, we have recently performed four uh, studies that I would like to show you now. First of all, uh, for my PhD, I'm very interested in functional outcome, and quality of life in these patients after the TBI. So we decided to perform a systematic review and meta-analysis that was actually published last year in the Brain and Spine Journal. And we specifically looked at unfavorable functional outcomes, dependency, nursing home admissions, depression, and quality of life deterioration in TBI patients over 65 years old. So we designed a search strategy, we screened all the found articles, and in the end, we could include a total of 27 studies uh, for the systematic review of which only, well, uh, of which 25 we could be further meta-analyzed. Um, the number of studies we could include is not that high, and that also reflects the scarce on of literature on the topic. Um, so from this systematic review, what we found interestingly is that when we looked at unfavorable functional outcomes, and specifically at 12 months follow-up, we performed a meta-analysis and the full prevalence of unfavorable functional outcomes defined as a Glasgow outcome scale lower than three and as a Glasgow outcome scale extended lower than four is that uh, there was a prevalence of 65.2%, which is quite high. And as you can see on the graph on the left, um, as expected, uh, patients with moderate and severe TBI had higher rates of unfavorable functional outcomes, but these outcomes, these poor outcomes were also present in mild TBI patients, especially at um, earlier time points of follow-up. Um, also, when we checked nursing home admission rates in our meta-analysis, we found quite a high prevalence. And there was a pool prevalence of 28.5% of nursing home admissions at one year post TBI. And in terms of dependency, we found also um, that 17 to 74% of the patients were dependent. Um, and a problem that we have been founding across this systematic review, also for the previous um, meta-analysis, is that there's a huge heterogeneity among studies. And that might indicate the need of more research on the topic, but also with more homogeneous protocols. Um, also, the studies reported a reduced quality of life in these patients. And for mild TBI patients, because um, there were not that many studies reporting depression data, but for mild TBI patients, there was a study reporting um, depression rates ranging between 3 and 5%. So from this study, we could conclude that traumatic brain injury can cause a very big impact on elderly patients' lives, leading to functional decline, depression, dependency, nursing home admission, and a quality of life deterioration. This impact is quite heterogeneous, but that can maybe also be solved by uh, the inclusion of more homogeneous protocols in future studies. But we also found that older ages and more severe injuries are risk factors for poor outcomes. 
So this study shows uh, the poor outcomes we can find in these patients after a TBI, but we also wanted to better understand what happened if patients older than 65 years old uh, were treated were having a neurosurgical intervention, what would those outcomes be? So that's why we did a second systematic review and meta-analysis. Uh, this hasn't been published yet, it's in preparation for submission, so I will just show you some small data and results. And we decided to, in this case, check um, for unfavorable functional outcomes and mortality at six months post uh, TBI and neurosurgical intervention in these patients over 65 years old. In this case, we included 25 articles of which 15 were further meta-analyzed. And what we saw is that at six months follow-up, 68.2% uh, of the patients had unfavorable outcomes, unfavorable functional outcomes, and 44.6% died. So after neurosurgery in elderly patients, we also see very poor outcomes. And well, these two systematic reviews helped us to better understand uh, functional outcomes in this population, uh, both after neurosurgery and conservative treatment. But we also wanted to understand a bit better the full picture and including injury mechanisms, clinical management, and how those would affect the outcomes, and specifically what happened in our hospital, in the University Hospital Leuven. So that's why we decided to start a retrospective study. This was a clinical database study um, over the last 20 years. So we included patients admitted to the hospital between 1999 and 2019. And that ended up in a very big uh, database of 1,480 TBI patients considering all injury severities. And in this big database, we found two interesting facts uh, that led to the two studies I'm going to present now. First of all, there were differences in injury mechanisms, clinical management, and outcomes in the last 20 decades. Uh, so from 1999 to 2019, there were quite some changes. So we wanted to, first of all, um, go into them to check what has changed and what are we doing now better than before. So what we did is manually screening uh, the clinical records of these 1,480 TBI patients over 65 years old that were admitted to the University Hospital Leuven between 1999 and 2019. We collected all the clinical relevant information, we put it in an access database, and we performed some statistical analysis also dividing um, these 20 year periods in four to five years intervals. So what we saw that was quite interesting is that in the last study period after 2015, we found the highest number of admissions, but also after 2004, patients had higher comorbidity rates. They had higher rates of cardiovascular history, polypharmacy, dependency for activities of daily living, antithrombotic drug intake. So that might indicate that now the patients that get admitted to the hospital for a TBI are frailer than they used to be before. Also, the injury mechanisms have changed. Um, we looked mainly at fall accidents, bicycle accidents, and traffic accidents as are the main cause we can find for TBI in elderly. And we see that fall accidents have decreased after 2014, traffic accidents decreased uh, after 2003, but now we have the highest bicycle accident rates. So the injury mechanisms also are changing. And that has also been reflected in the injury we found. So now in the last study period, we found higher median GCS at admission, also linked to lower subdural hematoma rates, uh, which might indicate that um, now the injuries are less severe in these frailer patients. These less severe injuries also result in less in lower hospitalization, intensive care unit admission, and neurosurgical intervention rates. 
So what was very interesting to and surprising to us is that when we looked at do not resuscitate orders, so a treatment withdrawal, we found that after 2004 and in this last study years, we are setting more do not resuscitate orders, but that has also been correlated uh, with lower mortality rates in this um, last period, specifically after 2015. So um, what we see from this study is that there's a demographic shift that continues to change. We are learning new things and that, yeah, will continue changing. There's a very big importance of precision medicine and we need a specific predi prediction modeling for these elderly patients. But we see that patients now that get admitted due to a TBI are frailer, they have higher number of comorbidities, but also they have less severe injuries and uh, they need less um, neurosurgical interventions and they have high, lower mortality rates despite the fact that we are uh, performing more treatment withdrawals. So that might indicate that now we are making better decisions for the clinical care of this patient. And thus this needs to be for sure further investigated to improve even more the clinical care. And after seeing this whole picture of the changes over the 20 years in our big patient database, there was also something that was interesting to us um, and that might introduce also a bit what my colleagues are going to talk about a bit later and it's neurosurgical intervention in elderly TBI patients. We saw that from our 14 uh, 180 TBI patients over 65 years old, there were around 150 patients that presented an acute subdural hematoma. But these patients were not treated that similarly despite having similar injuries. We found that there was a group that received an early surgery within 24 hours post-TBI. Then we had a group of patients that received late surgery by median 18 days post TBI, which was quite high. And there was the most numerous group of patients that weren't um, treated surgically. They received a uh, conservative treatment. So we wanted to better understand uh, the differences between these groups in terms of injury and demographic characteristics, but also the effects of the different timing of surgery and also the differences between your surgery and conservative treatment on outcomes. So what we saw is that the early, the group with early surgery, as expected, had the most severe injury at admission. They had a median GCS of 10, uh, also higher midline shifts, hematoma volumes, and Marshall CT scores. And that's probably why they received the early surgery. Then we had the late surgery group with had a median GCS at admission at 15. So that was still adequate. They still presented midline shifts, hematoma volumes, and a median Marshall CT score of three. And then we had the group of patients that received a conservative treatment. They weren't the patients with the highest age at injury. The patients with early surgery were older. And these patients still had a mild TBI. They didn't present midline shift. Uh, hematoma volumes were lower as expected and the Marshall CT score had a median of two. But what we saw is, well, as expected, Patients with an early surgery that had the most severe injuries had the highest mortality rates within 30 days post TBI. 22% of these patients died within 30 days. But then when we compared the patients with late surgery and conservative treatment to our surprise, the mortality rate in the patients with a conservative treatment was way higher. 17% of these patients uh, died within 30 days, while only 3% of the patients with a late surgery died. So uh, that was very surprising to us because we would have thought that patients with a conservative treatment that didn't need surgery would have better outcomes, but this wasn't the case. And these results, um, are based on a small sample size and this needs completely to be further investigated. But the results might indicate that if the GCS at admission is still adequate, 
Waiting for a bit longer than 24 hours to perform surgery might lead to better outcomes. So yeah, uh, that was it from my side. I think we will have time for questions at the end and I will give the word to Alfonso or my colleagues. Thank you, Rebecca. Fantastic presentation. And I think that it will open a lot of questions at the end. Uh, and it's a good introduction for, for Ana Maria Castaño, who is a neurosurgeon working, working in the Hospital of Octubre. And she's going to talk about also surgical treatment in this population. Your turn, Ana. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Okay, thank you for your invitation also to this webinar. I will talk to you about the surgical management of acute intracranial hematoma in the elderly. I will do a brief review of the literature and some results from our experience in, in Madrid. I have no conflict of interest to declare, and this is the summary of the presentation. To begin with some general issues, uh, age is an independent risk factor for mortality and disability after TBI. And for some authors, there is a linear rise in the risk of mortality with age, and especially it, it, it is uh, more evidence for patients that are older than uh, 55 years old. On the other hand, it is a risk factor for medical and postoperative complication, and it happens even independent of the health status of the patient and in the scenario of my GBI patients. So um, there is a self-fulfilling prophecy, as it has been discussed previously, to not treat a, in a similar manner elderly patients. For example, in this Scottish a study, uh, they found that the rate of transfer to a specialized neurosurgical unit for a significant less uh, frequent for elderly patients. And in the uh, center TBI uh, survey, age was a single factor influencing the neurosurgical decision in more than 80% uh, of the survey centers. And this prejudice also affects their intensive care. For example, in this retrospective study that it also have, has been discussed previously, uh, they reviewed more than 1,000 patients and they, uh, that were treated in the Oslo University Hospital in a four-year period. They evaluated treatment intensity by calculating a score in which one point was added to any of these measures. And they found that the management intensity decreased with advanced age, and it was irrespectively of the TBI severity. And this low management intensity was associated with an increased risk of uh, in hospital mortality. But the decision to not provide near intensive care is not supported by the results from the Uppsala University Hospital. Uh, they provide an uh, intensive care, uh, as you can see in the bottom part of the, of the presentation. And those patients that receive modern uh, intensive care have a chance of good outcome in a rate of 50% of, of the patient. But the same benefit was not uh, found for patients that were elder, older than 75 years old. Then I will present uh, the most important studies that have evaluated elderly patients undergoing surgery for any kind of a traumatic intracranial hematoma. Here I present a nationwide uh, population-based study from Finland, and they found that there was a temporal trend to a higher mean age uh, during the study period. And the incidence of surgical procedures had decreased a uh, bit most uh, importantly for those patients, patients that were between 60 and 70 years old. And in the univariate model, the latest um, uh, study period uh, was associated with uh, less uh, risk of mortality compared with the first uh, study period. So uh, the authors proposed that maybe an explanation is that the increase in the number of patients are explained by mild TBI patients that not require uh, surgery. 
and there is a, a better patient selection for those that will benefit more for, from surgery. In this retrospective analysis of 12 years of the USA registry of the TBI patients, patients similar results were found with a temporal trend to reduce number of surgical patients compared to the increased amount of patients that were attended in the emergency department. And surgery in the geriatric patient was associated with higher rate of complication, but not difference in mortality in that uh, patient that were uh, underwent any surgical procedure. <clears throat> Similar results uh, were found in this cohort of 23 patients that were older than 80 years old from the Michigan University Hospital. And FCMODA described for the first time um, uh, data from the Japan Neurotrauma Data Bank. The, for the first time, as I have said, uh, they revealed that the surgical group of patients has less rate of mortality and high risk of good recovery if they were uh, operated. <clears throat> and it depended on the type of intracranial injury. For example, the patients that benefit more from surgery were those that had surgical hematoma. But we have to take to pay attention that board holes were included into the analysis. So maybe some chronic or subacute surgical uh, hematoma were also included into the analysis. <clears throat> In this German registry uh, of severe trauma, the analysis, uh, they analyzed the standardized mortality ratio and they found that for all age groups, they uh, observed better than expected outcome in the surgical group of patients. <clears throat> Focusing on contusion, uh, I have found this study from the TARN database. And um, uh, they found that age was associated with increased risk of mortality, but also with high, uh, longer time between the time of uh, injury and the time of the, the CT scan was uh, acquired. And they also found a more likelihood of not being transferred to the neurosurgical center or to be reviewed by a junior, senior, uh, and not senior uh, doctor. So again, this difference in the management can, can explain difference also in the outcome in elderly patients. Now talking about sudural hematoma that will be discussed uh, extensively for my colleagues, uh, I will review some evidences. For example, for Petridis, they state difference indication for surgical hematoma uh, as they uh, put uh, attention to the Glasgow Coma Scale pupils and also the relationship between the surgical hematoma thickness and the midline shape to, to indicate the surgical hematoma evacuation. Here, there is a uh, a brief summary of the uh, studies that have uh, evaluated prognostic factors related to outcome in sudural hematoma in the elderly patient. Um, and you can see that most of them are retrospective observational studies with a uh, wide variation in the definition of elderly patient that varied between 65 and 80 years old. And there are also some uh, studies that have a, a small uh, size of, of the cohort of the, the data set of patients. Um, the mortality varied a lot. You can see here this is study with 27% of mortality at hospital discharge compared to this one of 70 uh, rate of mortality, uh, of mortality after six months after TBI. And uh, most of them evaluated risk factor associated with mortality. And the most consistent one was Glasgow Coma Scale, pupils, and some uh, CT findings as the midline shift and the pseudural thickness. And instead for one, the, this is the one author that found any significant association between comorbidities and the outcome of, of patient. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, more recent data um, and optimistic came from the Mayo Clinic. Uh, they found only a 13 rate of mortality at hospital discharge, but the authors recognize that they cannot discern with high specificity if the if the procedure was indeed a craniotomy or borehole. So again, uh, studies, especially those that are based on the of administration data, can um, Mm, it's difficult to 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 get a, 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 a clear conclusion because sudural hematoma, a chronic or sort of acute sudural hematoma can be included into into the analysis. A recent meta-analysis from Mani Banam has um, put together the results from most of the studies that have I've been talking about. And they uh, conclude that the outcome of in, after surgical hematoma uh, surgery in the elderly is associated with a uh, poor outcome. They, the pool uh, mortality was 40% in a uh, hospital discharge and uh, almost 50% at the last follow-up. Uh, for poor outcome, it was the rate of 80% and 80% also uh, at the last follow-up. Regarding the compressive craniotomy, um, there are some data from this study, but as you can see, the rate of mortality or severe disability, um, probably we can say that we have no evidences to, to recommend this desperate measure in this kind of patient, even uh, where, where most of the, the compressive craniotomy were primary, the compressive craniotomy after the evacuation of a sudural hematoma. And to uh, finish with my presentation, I have reviewed uh, 493 adult patients that were uh, older than 60 years old that require a hospital admission at, in, at our institution. And the median age was 80 years old. And there was no difference between the incidence between males and females. Uh, almost one third of patients were on, on antithrombotic treatment. The main mechanism was false, and the vast majority of, of patients were considered mild TBI patients, but 17% uh, of them deteriorate to a Glasgow coma scale below nine points within 24 hours after TBI. The main um, uh, traumatic intracranial lesion was sudural hematoma alone or, or in association with a, a contusion. Um, we see at our, at our center that uh, the 50% the of patients were included, uh, were admitted in the ICU, but only 10% of them were ICP monitored, and the surgical treatment was indicated in just 44, uh, 48 patients. Most of them, the reason to, to go to, uh, to the operating room was uh, the evacuation of a sudural hematoma. And similar to the meta-analysis uh, result of mortality at the chart, as the chart was 40% uh, uh, of, of the patient. When we have evaluated factor associated with the surgical treatment indication, uh, we see that the only factor that remained in the, in the multivariate analysis was age uh, and pupils, and a trend from swelling, swelling um, and the midline shift. Here we can see that we did not operate any patient older than 19 years old. I'm talking about uh, surgery in the first uh, 44, 48 hours. Um, factor associated with uh, in-hospital mortality, again, in the multivariate uh, analysis was age, anticoagulation treatment, injury severity score, CT Marshall uh, classification, and the presence of intraventricular hemorrhage. But age was not an independent factor related to mortality in the uh, surgical cohort of elderly patients. So to conclude, uh, despite poor outcomes uh, compared to younger patients, uh, surgical therapy and intensive care should not be contraindicated just by age. The compressive craniotomy should not be performed in elderly patients until new evidences are put together. And it will be very useful, a better identification of patients that will benefit more from aggressive management. And that's all from my side. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you, Anna. I think the uh, uh, most uh, interesting uh, presentation, and, and it will get more, more and more questions. Uh, I think we are going to go with, uh, with uh, I don't know if Alex or Thomas. Uh, maybe um, uh, Thomas is. Uh, are you ready, Alex, or it would be better for for Thomas to begin? I'm ready as well. Um, okay. Okay. So. so so uh, uh, Alexander Jones is a neurosurgeon from Heidelberg uh, Department of Neurosurgery, and he's going to talk about the German experience. We've been seeing the, the Spanish experience, now the German experience. <laughs> yeah, indeed. So I'll just uh, share my screen. I have to apologize. It might get a little loud in between because my little daughter is next to me. Uh, um, we'll see how this goes. So um, yeah, I want to... A briefly touch or hopefully briefly touch a German perspective on this topic on TBI in elderly patients and I think most of the things have already somehow been said and um, I wanted to yeah, just introduce this, this theory of mine so one reason potentially that uh, TBI in elderly is somehow proper now is that TBI in younger patients as uh, TBI at least is, is, uh, is uh, reduced uh, today so one of the reasons might be that uh, Tay motorbikes from the 17th were um, replaced uh, in uh, the, the years after um, with faster motorbikes. Everybody who drops a motorbike knows, and this obviously led to yeah, this obviously led to many more accidents in the upcoming years. And if you look at the uh, the uh, fa fatal head injuries in Germany, at least, and this is data from the Federal Bureau, Bureau of Statistics, you can see that. These um, were quite high in the 70s, 80s, and even 90s. And uh, there were some changes due to, for, for example, mandatory helmet uh, for bikers, but those were actually really a problem. And um, what happened afterwards was the population has been aging. We have uh, been hearing this uh, this evening. And then um, something changed in the epidemiolo epidemiology in Germany when in the 90s, at least, the uh, age distribution of fatal head injuries was between 15 and let's say 30 years. Uh, and nearly 30 years later, this was already, uh, uh, it, it's basically a big shift to uh, people aged uh, above 75 years. And this is also represented in uh, the current causes of fatal head injuries. Uh, we've seen that this have been mostly traffic accidents. Um, in the past, now traffic accidents are really uh, rare. They're uh, down here and uh, the most common injuries are accidents of other causes, mainly uh, falls um, from the elderly at home. Now, this is the data, the most current data available for the fatal head, head injuries due to uh, road uh, traffic accidents. And this is substantially lower, as you can see here. Um, the total number of TBI patients in Germany is not decreasing, so it still plays a very important role in Europe and also in Germany today. Uh, on the left side, you see the total number of cases uh, admit, ad, uh, admitted in German hospitals in 2000, and nearly 20 years later, this has actually been increasing despite the fatal head injuries um, decreasing. And if you look at the age distribution, you can see that this is mainly due to these old people aged below uh, above 65 years that have been um, increasing. And uh, as we have previously heard, and I just want to touch on this quickly as well, the surgeries that uh, we are now doing, for example, SDH removal, uh, those surgeries, we also do them in, in the older population. As you can see data from uh, uh, SDH uh, removals pe performed in Germany in 2005 and 2018. And this has uh, shifted here again. We mostly do it in those older people now, even uh, above 90 years. So um, briefly, um, the European perspective, um, the Senate TBI, study has, Senate TBI uh, study has been mentioned and we have seen in this study but we already had expected that the median age is indeed also in Europe uh, in, uh, increasing. Now uh, patients are older, the median age is 50 years. And um, uh, as we already discussed, falls are the, the most uh, dominant cause of injury. The patients are often anticoagulated and they have comorbidities. Um, so are those uh, our current patients? Maybe, um, actually love this, this video. <laughs> so this is maybe, what we already see now in our uh, emergency departments or what we will be seeing in the future. And um, when we looked at the oldest patients uh, in the center TBI, 
uh, study population a little bit more closely. And we, uh, we saw that there are actually 380 patients in uh, around 4,500 study patients in the core study that are actually older than 80 years, between 80 and 100 years. And the median age in this population is 84 years. And um, what has been shown in the overall population is even more dominant here. So um, incidental falls, nearly 80% cause of injury. Uh, mild injuries are fairly common, but uh, patients have a really uh, high rate of uh, comorbidities. For example, even cardiac comorbidities, one of, let's say, the worst comorbidity you can have is 53%. And the rate of anti-relation uh, meds is also even higher in this population with 65% as expected. And um, in this um, oldest of the oldest patients, uh, pathological brain CT findings are very frequent even after those uh, mild injuries. And uh, surprisingly, uh, in the center TPI study at least, the rate of intracranial surgeries are still, uh, this rate is still very low. And um, you can see the data, at least for some cases, why surgery has been performed and why not. And we are very interested in whether or not age played a role. And interestingly, uh, in Europe, in the Senate Senate PI study at least, the uh, decision against surgery was rarely um, uh, uh, placed, uh, uh, was, was rarely taken due to old age, despite uh, you know, talking about octo and nonagenarians here. Um, overall, the unfavorable rate of... Un <laughs> unfavorable outcomes was uh, 49% defined by the GSE below four. So yeah, this is uh, difficult to interpret, right? Is it high, is it low? I would say even the um, the high rates of the old age and the high rates of comorbidities and, and anticoagulation, this is acceptable actually. Uh, we looked at predictors, uh, let's say factors associated with an unfavorable outcome in these really old patients. And it is what you would have expected from a younger population already. So this has to be in the future sharp indefinitely, but it's age still. And then the pupillary reaction alterations or a baseline GCS, then also loss of consciousness, maybe something relevant for the mild uh, TBI patients. Of course, the presence of uh, traumatic intracranial pathology and then complications and intracranial uh, pressure elevation. So um, this um, is center TBI data. And what it, uh, what it shows is that those old and potentially even those oldest patients, they cause uh, new challenges. One uh, that has been mentioned is uh, our anticoagulation. We know from other studies that uh, approximately 3% of the age population receives um, anticoagulation therapy. Uh, we've seen this in the data just presented in the previous talks. And uh, we know that in general, the incidence of traumatic ICH has increased. If you take anticoagulation meds, and uh, those patients, they are a big problem in the ICH um, patient population as well. They have a higher risk of death and worse long-term outcomes. So um, that's something we should be aware of. Uh, that's a new challenge, especially in the oldest patients. The uh, other big problem, big burden is frailty and comorbidities. So this has been uh, mentioned um, uh, previously already. We did an analysis uh, of chronic subdural uh, hematoma patients in our department and we looked um, in the general population who had comorbidities and who didn't and then we looked at the rate of reparations due to re hematoma recurrence uh, within 30 days and you, as you can see here patient uh, patients who have a comorbidity have a significant higher rate of reoperations and interestingly in our analysis of those patients this was the only uh, variable that was uh, that was um, really uh, associated with uh, reparation, um, not even uh, anticoagulation medication, not age, but only the presence of comorbidities. Uh, so in our uh, uh, own hospital, we, we really uh, look for um, those comorbidities and try to treat them accordingly and to be careful with them, even in chronic subdural hematoma patients. <laughs> we know that uh, these factors, anticoagulation drugs, uh, uh, frailty, and comorbidities, uh, they actually um, decrease the rate of favorable outcomes and decrease the uh, rate of death after TBI. So, TBI. so this is another study that uh, has just proven this fact and uh, the previous talks have, have also proven it. Um, now I want to um, address a little bit what has been done or what we can do to still um, have better outcomes for those old patients. Um, and maybe uh, whether or not we should 
uh, treat them on uh, at all. Uh, so concerning the problem of uh, anticoagulation, this is a study uh, done by Albert Brexley in Germany, and um, they basically looked at the impact of direct oral anticoagulants uh, versus um, vitamin K antagonists. And um, in this small study, they, they suggested that in older patients, uh, anticoagulation with, with those newer drugs might be safer than with vitamin K antagonists. So there might be ways of um, making uh, anticoagulation medication safer in the oldest uh, patients, but this definitely has to be uh, proven in, uh, pro in uh, prospective studies as well. And then um, uh, many people and also Per Enblatt and his group published on um, neurointensive care, very there there is sorry, neurointensive care for the uh, oldest TBI patients. And they looked at uh, uh, a cohort of um, patients with high age, multiple injuries, a really low uh, GCS, and all those factors were actually negative prognostic factors, um, as you can already suggest. But they um, they basically summarized that uh, even um, with a higher age, when patients receive modern neuron ICU care, they still have a chance of favorable outcome. Um, and they don't have uh, a large risk of severe deficits in vegetative state. So this is an optimistic uh, message from this group here. We, um, and this has already been mentioned in the previous talk, we looked at our own oldest acute subdural hematoma patients in a really small study. Um, and we uh, assessed 27 patients and we compared them to a, a matched younger uh, ASDH patient cohort. Predictors for favorable outcomes where um, higher GCS, um, again, less or no pre-existing comorbidity in the smaller uh, volume of the acute subdural. And uh, as you can see on the graph on the right side, the outcome in these very old patients with acute subdural hematoma and those were mostly severely injured patients uh, is not detrimental per se. I think this is one of the messages that you have heard previously as well. And um, uh, lastly, we uh, looked at the very old um, uh, patients with chronic subdural hematoma as well. In our cohort of chronic subdural hematomas in the last uh, 10 years, we identified 253 patients uh, aged more than 80 years. So again, octo and nonagenarians. And uh, we, uh, we looked at whether or not the modified ranking scale improved uh, on discharge. So this is not easy to, it's not actually that easy um, or whether or not it this did not improve or even worsened. And we looked at uh, the patients. So those 253 very, very old patients had a mean age of 84 years, mostly males. This is very dominant in those older cohorts compared to, uh, even compared to younger ones. Uh, a crazy high rate of comorbidities present, a high rate of anticoagulation. And um, that's really interesting, I think. So we're talking about chronic subdural hematoma as well, very common disease. And I think uh, many of you, when they, um, when they have a, a very old patient, a patient, they might actually think about whether to do surgery or not. And this is just a hint. So in this cohort, the rate of surgical complications, something you really fear in those old patients was very, relatively low, 7.5%. Non-surgical complication on the, on the other side, and he recounted everything from minor um, urinary tract infections uh, to stroke. Um, this rate is, um, as maybe as can be expected, uh, high with 35%. Uh, nevertheless, uh, mortality in this old patient cohort is low. Um, they can sometimes be discharged home. Many of them go back to their um, caring facility, so not home. And um, uh, they reported in a very high number of cases that their main symptom had been improved. And the rate of reparation within 90 days, so this is a common problem for chronic subdural hematoma, was actually fairly low in this old patient population compared at least to our own younger patient population. So in those really old patients, factors associated with improvement of MRS on discharge were whether or not they had comorbidities so when you are very old and you have no com comorbidity, obviously you're very healthy and you know, the risk of, ha um, of having a worse outcome is lower. No surgical complications, uh, no non-surgical complications. So better not have any complications when you're old and a short hospital stay. 
this um, already concludes my uh, talk. Oh. And uh, yeah, this is basically my conclusion. I think this adds to what uh, the excellent other talks have already showed uh, elderly patients with DBI are on the rise. They pose new challenges and uh, we can still treat them. Uh, and even when we do surgery, it's not detrimental per se. Thank you for your time and patience. Thank you, Alex. And thank you for managing so well the, the talk with your difficulties, but you have managed perfectly. Thank you so much. Uh, and now is, uh, is the, the, the time for, for Thomas Van Essen. He's a neurosurgeon working in, in Leiden and La Hague University Medical Center. And he's going to talk about uh, research uh, in TBI, new research uh, in TBI in the elderly uh, regarding the, the treatment of acute structural hematoma. Whatever you want, Thomas. So I'll share my uh, presentation. Wait a second. Thank you, Alfonso. Uh, so I'll present uh, a study protocol of the uh, reset ICA, which is a randomized trial of acute surgery versus conservative treatment to the elderly with a traumatic acute surgery hematoma. So I couldn't expect a better build-up for my presentation. Um, Rebecca, Anna, Alfonso, and Alexander have done a terrific job in uh, explaining the rationale of, uh, of our study, actually. Uh, so I'll keep it short. Uh, nevertheless, I'll have some brief introductory remarks, after which I'll uh, explain the uh, study uh, design and the uh, further details. So first of all, the study has been funded by uh, the uh, Belgium, and Dutch, Belgium and Dutch public research organizations, Zonnenwe and KCE. And in their benefit project, <clears throat> their aim, their purpose is to, to fund <coughs> uh, non-commercially uh, driven research with a very clear, pragmatic and clinically relevant aim. And the main reason, of course, for our study is the fact that it's becoming a clinical reality of, uh, of traumatic brain injury. It's the burning, burning clinical, clinical question to operate or not in patients with an acute subdural hematoma, in the elderly patients with an acute subdural hematoma. TBI, as we've learned already, um, is, um, is uh, increasingly uh, an, um, uh, an, uh, an illness of the, old, of the elderly patient. So uh, we've seen this, this epidemiological shift from a typical patient being a young, a little bit reckless young uh, male after a high energy trauma with a cutsudary hematoma, a lot of contusional injury also. And that has progressed to the situation that a typical patient now increasingly becomes an, uh, an older person who after a relatively trivial head trauma uh, is on anticoagulants as an isolated acute subdural hematoma often with uh, sometimes with contusions. So um, <clears throat> uh, this, this is at least pertains to the EU as we've confirmed in the Center TBI project, uh, age is increasing and acute subdural hematoma is mo most predominant uh, focal uh, uh, hematoma. So older age has traditionally been associated with uh, with poor outcome, with very poor outcome actually. Uh, mortality rates up to ninety percent, uh, and uh, of course the most likely causes uh, are of course the comorbidities associated with higher age. But another hypothesis could be is that this is so called as uh, as Anna already told us already is uh, there can can be some kind of self-fulfilling prophecy in the patients are less aggressively treated. Well, over time, mortality has increased significantly. And of course, again, probably due to more efficient and effective uh, emergency care, better diagnostic, but also possibly due to the fact that uh, neurosurgery is more appropriately uh, uh, employed. That is, maybe more aggressive neurosurgical care is appropriate. We don't know that. Evidence uh, does not help us any further. 
which was the same problem of the well-known brain trauma foundation guidelines uh, unfortunately only based on uh, uh, low quality evidence uh, nevertheless they managed to um, uh, issue some um, very solid recommendations however not for the uh, elderly uh, subgroup um, furthermore also um, and difficult is the fact that these prognostic models which all we all know depression impact might be less valid for the elderly because the data sets from which they were derived uh, um, mostly included younger patients. So the decision in acute moments is without, uh, uh, I would say, um, uh, guidelines that are based on strong evidence or without a uh, prognostic strong estimate. So does that lead to a clinical dilemma? So in other words, is there uh, clinical treatment variation? Uh, so that was exactly the research question we had in 2017. We, uh, depicted here, and we sent out uh, six hypothetical cases to all neurosurgeons in the Netherlands and in Belgium, and we simply asked, would you operate this patient? I brought two cases of uh, the older persons, older males. First case, case three, is a, is a man of 17 years old, who's deeply comatose, has a non-reactive light, left pupil, and has a large acute subdermatoma on the left side. Case four, so the second case, is a, is a patient on the other end of the clinical spectrum, 79 years old, uh, has a headache, uh, has a um, slight decrease in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in GCS, 14, and has a slightly paratic right arm. No other focal uh, 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 discrepancies. A large acute subdermal dome on the left side as well. So would you operate this patient? Simple question. And as you can see here on the right, uh, three out of four neurosurgeons would operate this patient acutely, acutely and one out of four wouldn't. So I'll focus on case four now. So the, uh, the patient with a, uh, a little bit better prognosis. And interesting to see is also that if you would stratify this according to regions, that there's a strong treatment preference. Possibly, of course, uh, very uh, training based or culturally driven. Um, and this is exactly um, uh, the rationale of, uh, of, uh, of our study, of course. So uh, lack of evidence, uh, um, a lot of uncertainty, clinical dilemma. Uh, in other words, there's a clinical equipoise, which is the basic premise for a, uh, for a randomized controlled trial. Therefore, we devised a reset ISDH, which aims to test the superiority of early surgery versus conservative treatment in the elderly with a traumatic acute subdermatoma. We are fortunate enough to have uh, over 15 centers in the Netherlands and Belgium, level one trauma centers, to participate in our trial. Um, and um, here you can see a, a schematic uh, de uh, depiction of this. So we aim to include patients over the age uh, we uh, 65 before, but we changed it to 55. The most important inclusion criterion is there has to be clinical equipoise as just judged by the treating neurosurgeon. I'll come back to that later. There has to be certain patient and radiological characteristics. In short, uh, a non comatose patient has to have a large acute subdermatoma. A non comatose patient should have a small acute subdermatoma. Informed consent should be obtained, or it's also allowed to have the patient included on the deferred consent. We have some obvious exclusion criteria, so uh, um, um, an, a concomitant epidural hematoma or an infratentorial hematoma, significant extracranial injuries, or a poor neurological or systemic uh, uh, prognosis from the start. So we aimed to include. 300 pay we aim to include 300 patients which is based on the sample size calculation of a proportional odds regression model but in a proportional odds ratio of two and the other details are already explained uh, more or less so to stimulate inclusion we've devised this uh, we we, we uh, presented this graph to the uh, including centers and this graph is a um, 
uh, is a visual representation of the continuum of patients that should and should not be included or that can or cannot be included. So for example, a 79 year old female who's on a skull has no neurological uh, uh, discrepancies and has a right acute toma with a minimal amount of shift. Everybody would agree probably that this patient will not be, uh, should not be operated. So this patient, there's no clinical occupies and cannot be included in the study. On the other end of this graph is an older patient, of an older male, 75 year old, it's on anticoagulants from Cocomon for atrial fibrillation, deeply comatose, has a white non-reactive pupil on the left side and a large acutodrematoma with a significant amount of shifts. So this patient, there might be a lot of uncertainty. Some wouldn't operate, some would. Uh, so there is clinical acupoise, but this patient is not suited for randomization because the conservative treatment arm would mean a definite death. Patient there are suited, we proposed his uh, examples. An 87 year old female, which is actually a case uh, a couple of weeks ago, had a, a trivial head injury, uh, uses apixaban, a new anticoagulant for atrial fibrillation, who has a GCS of 13 and has a right acute subdermatoma, very large. So, most neurosurgeons, most neurosurgeons would probably have a direct reflex to treat or not treat these patients. But that's not the question for this study. The question is, um, is there genuine uncertainty among our medical, uh, our surgical uh, uh, community, uh, whether this patient should be treated, which is clinical equipoise. Another example, different subgroup, but same study. 17 year old male uh, on uh, uh, anticoagulant, acenicumol, who's comatose and has a small uh, right side of the kutsubdurumtoma and probably a more contusional injury. Again, the question is would you perform a, a conservative treatment with an ICP sensor or would you directly uh, perform, for example, and most likely a decompressive craniectomy, primary decompressive craniectomy? Again, the reflex might be should definitely do uh, one of uh, either treatment strategies. But that's not the question for the study. The question is, is there a clinical acrypoise? So it pertains to this middle group, which is not easily defined, and therefore it's called a continuum. So this is a theory of our uh, study, and uh, <clears throat> I haven't explained all details, of course, but this can be found in our recently published protocol in trials. So, so far the, um, uh, the uh, methodological uh, theory and now the harsh clinical reality, we have included zero patients up to now. Um, um, so there are some obvious reasons for this. First of all, we started in 2021 uh, and we aim to start three times, but we were constantly uh, uh, restricted by uh, another COVID wave. But there might be some other reasons as well. Why haven't, why haven't included patients yet in this year? So are there not enough patients maybe? Well, that probably is not enough uh, uh, sufficient cost because we only uh, estimated to, to need one to two patients per center per month. We have over 15 centers, uh, have an inclusion period of two to three years. So that probably wouldn't be the, the, the problem. So, What's the problem then? Is it no, not a real clinical dilemma? Is there no equipoise? Does anybody, everybody know what to do? Well, then we need to answer this question. If for the elderly patients with the acute subdermatoma, does an honest professional disagreement among expert clinicians exist regarding the preferred treatment? And it can only be one answer, of course. Yes, there clearly is, as I've shown in this uh, survey uh, before. But then a valid question is, of course, this hypothetical treatment variation. Is there actual, uh, uh, an actual treatment variation? Well, that was one of the research questions we uh, uh, answered recently and we just published. Um, 
and among 1,400 patients with an acute subdermatoma in, uh, in Europe, we uh, showed there to be a high uh, difference in surgery rates. So without explaining the details too much, as you can, which, which, what you can take away from this image is that there is an adjusted for case mix, there is an over twofold higher probability of receiving acute surgery for an identical patient between two randomly chosen centers in Europe. So that probably isn't uh, the reason as well. So finally, is there another reason we uh, haven't uh, uh, critically um, uh, appraised enough yet? So is the clinical equipoise criterion appropriately employed? Um, this has already been uh, explained in the, uh, in the 80s as an important uh, difficulty in recruiting patients into randomized trials. Um, so as I've explained uh, how we uh, employ clinical acupoise, some might um, 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 interpret clinical acupoise as, as the same as some as uncertainty on the uh, individual clinician uh, level. And that certainly is not uh, how it should be interpreted. And as neurosurgeons, they are highly skilled uh, uh, decision makers by training, uh, sometimes also by character, uh, they do uh, uh, might show less uncertainty, definitely in the acute moment, than um, uh, uh, to uh, to uh, allow to include enough patients in the study. So for now, we've we've confronted every center and every neurosurgeon with this principle, and we hope to. Uh, uh, to include more patients uh, after this. For now, we'll, uh, we'll plow on uh, with our study. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, again Alfonso for putting together this webinar and uh, uh, all other uh, panelists for their very interesting talks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Thomas. Very, very interesting. Uh, I think uh, this kind of research is uh, uh, very well designed and I hope you will have more enthusiastic participation from neurosurgeons uh, after your talk. Um, I think there have been some questions from uh, the audience. I think uh, there's one about uh, uh, something that I wanted also to, uh, to, to question you all. Um, Bart Debetier says that it appears we need personalized precision medicine in these patients. Could you comment on how would you, you would do this? I was going to ask uh, all of you that were talking about the surgical treatment. Um, you are always saying that the surgical treatment is not uh, poor per se, and, and, and Rebecca showed us that certain patients can benefit from um, not uh, an acute treatment, but maybe a later on treatment. And you've shown uh, that uh, surgery could be an option also, Thomas and Anna. Could you, could you think of how we could design or, uh, or make any um, uh, addition to, to models or to research in order to uh, get more personalized medicine in these patients? Maybe Rebecca has an answer. <laughs> Rebecca, not, then Anna, and then Thomas. Not completely. What I was thinking about is that definitely we need uh, to research for optimized selection criteria for surgery because we don't really, we have seen that there are differences in patients and the results are sometimes heterogeneous and we don't have a, a consistent conclusion of whether we should operate or not these patients. So maybe we should go more to investigate, okay, which patients and uh, which with criteria should we investigate? Mm -hmm. Anna, any thoughts? <laughs> uh, we need a better identification of those patients that will benefit more. And first of all, most of the prognostic uh, model that we usually use were not developed with these patients. So we need a better prognostic uh, models and Probably biomarkers can also uh, improve to uh, in, to identificate those patients with a higher risk of going uh, with, with poor outcome. I don't know. We need to 
to look for that. Thomas, you presented a, a randomized study. Is that the only option? Well, uh, no, that's not the only option, but I think that it li uh, my, my answer would be it lies in, uh, along the same line. You need, you, you need to have comparative studies. It's very easy. And, and, and the RCT is the, uh, is the most definite answer you would get. We just did, uh, you've just done a large comparative effectiveness study in, with Center TBI data on uh, operating versus uh, conservative treatment. And um, um, uh, although I think that the, 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 the bias has been mostly uh, addressed, still you, would, uh, you, you will find some uh, uh, difficulties in interpreting this, uh, this, uh, this results because patients get treated for a certain reason and patients are not treated uh, or conservatively treated will get uh, treated for, will not be treated for a certain reason. So this confounding will be, is always very strong. So you need to have large properly designed comparative studies to give a definite answer. Yeah. I think we've missed Alex, but uh, I was going to ask, uh, um, to ask you about, someone has uh, said uh, in the chat, uh, a comment regarding uh, if decompressive craniectomy has the same impact in, in elderly as, as in, young, in younger patients. What, what do you think about uh, the treatment? Uh, I guess that, uh, Thomas, in your, in your uh, study, the treatment is just craniotomy, bore holes, or a, any, kind of, any kind of surgical, of surgical treatment, or uh, can it be a decompressive craniectomy as well? And what do you all feel about decompressive craniectomy in these patients? Thomas, please uh, begin you if you want. Yeah. So the uh, your first question um, relates to the reset study. Uh, no, the, so the acute surgery arm, I haven't explained it uh, properly. Indeed, is the uh, is craniotomy to evacuate the intome or the decompressive craniectomy, and uh, the, the initial conservative treatment arm, um, uh, and of course also the acute surgery treatment arm can include a delayed burial uh, strategy. Um, well, what, what I think of decompressed craniectomy in the elderly patients, yeah, so this is, yeah, the, the logical uh, reflex I have is that it's, it's uh, associated with a lot of complications uh, as it is, but in elderly patients even more so. So I would be very hesitant to, uh, to do that, of course, but um, um, that's from a clinical perspective. And um, yeah, so that's a major, uh, major take I have. <coughs> And I'm now our decompressive craniectomy expert in Madrid. What do you think about <laughs> doing this procedure in the elderly? Uh, I think there is no uh, evidence to support this measure in elderly people. So maybe uh, people have the opportunity to undergo uh, to a craniotomy to evacuate any mass lesion. But if you have to know the opportunity to replace the, the bone flap, it means that uh, maybe it's, uh, it, is in, it will be better to put the bone flap uh, and wait for the outcome that is going to be expected in the next day that uh, delay the, the final outcome with a poor, um, with a lot of complication. Uh, uh, I think there is not there is no uh, results to, to do this measure in, people older than maybe 65 years old. Alex, what do you think about that? I think the problem is again, that there's no specific data and study for this in TBI. And as we know that uh, if finding the right patient for DC in the TB, general TBI population is already challenging. And we have to, in, in the future, define which patient really will benefit from this procedure. It's gonna be even more difficult in the, in the older and oldest patient population. I mean, what we have seen in Destiny 1 and 2, uh, the studies for DC after stroke, if you do this kind of study in a subsequent uh, special population like the older patients, you can actually find out that they also benefit in maybe even more than uh, the general population. So I think, again, you could not generally exclude the compressive craniectomy from older, the oldest patients. So uh, I think in our hospital, we, uh, we do it in older patients essentially as well, but uh, the selection is even more difficult, I think, than in the general population, the younger patients. So I don't know. Okay, so and Rebecca, what is your experience in Leuven about uh, decompressive craniectomy? How many were performed in, the, in, the, in your study? 
And yes. I had another question regarding your study. It is that uh, how uh, this uh, delay treatment included uh, Verhoeven treatment uh, of a, a chronic subdural hematoma? Uh, so regarding the decompressive conectomy, we couldn't, we had a relatively small sample size. It was 150 patients. So we couldn't do sub-analysis by surgery type. So I don't really have the results of the comparative results between different techniques to give you an answer to that. So I, I, I don't know, I don't know at the moment. And uh, yeah. Were, were they performed in elderly people or? Yes, or, they were okay. performed. Okay. Yes, but we didn't have enough sample size just to, to compare, but it would be ideal that in the future there are comparative studies to see the differences, of course. And regarding this uh, Borhold uh, in, in the delayed uh, treatment group that you showed that had better yeah. prognosis, is that uh, the chronification of a subdural hematoma that then is evacuated uh, through a Borhold or is it a different kind of patient? So it was patients that uh, were admitted with a relatively good state, but deteriorated uh, later. And it was by median 18 days. So it was initially an acute subdural hematoma that evolved. And, and then they decided to perform the surgery. And the surgery was uh, craniotomy or any other? Uh, we included all kinds of surgery. All kinds of surgery. Uh, yeah. OK. I just had a question for Thomas regarding the, the age inclusion in your study. Um, um, it is 55 years of age. Why? Why is that? Because 55 is, is, not, is not really being old. <laughs> I'm nearly that age. <laughs> so what's the uh, reason? Yeah, so it was, it was uh, briefly, previously it was the age of the PI, but... Uh, we decided to uh, lower it. Now that's a, that's of course an obvious joke, but um, so we had a 65 year old age limit before, and uh, we decided to lower it because we uh, um, uh, first of all uh, age of course is it's arbitrary what we what you would constitute as older age or elderly. So nobody would say above 55 is elderly. But the most important reason for this is the fact that we saw we still saw a lot of clinical equipoise in patients um, around 60, around uh, 58, and uh, even younger, of course, also. Uh, but, um, and um, we, 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 uh, we took the, yeah, the opportunity of this RCT to, inc to, to increase this uh, the inclusion and, and also to increase, inclus uh, inc increase the inclusion rate for uh, uh, for the study. So uh, I would definitely agree uh, that nobody would be called uh, elderly if they are 55, but this is a pragmatic uh, reason to, uh, to, ch to have changed that. Okay. I just have one more comment and then we can, I think, finish. Uh, Magda Gaston says that uh, decompressive craniotomy, uh, decompressive craniotomy and craniotomy outcomes are like throwing a coin in this population. Do you think that is um, uh, that is right, or could you could you change that uh, sentence somehow? Any of you? Um, do you think the, the attitude towards uh, these patients is not? Uh, uh, I mean, uh, to decide or not to decide if operate on a patient is throwing a coin. Uh, what do you feel about that? Maybe Thomas. Do you, what do you think? I would, I I think we can do better than that. I think you can you should have an uh, you can make a, a a proper clinical judgment based on uh, the evidence you have on whether or not it is appropriate to uh, perform a, a, a craniotomy and decrease craniotomy. So on the elderly patient, you have to know what kind of trauma injury it was. Like. It mostly is a trivial head trauma, so probably uh, the patient will have an isolated hematoma. That's quite amenable for uh, 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 a small craniotomy, uh, evacuating hematoma. Um, so you form this hypothesis based on trauma injury mechanisms, on based on whether or not they use anticoagulants, based on uh, on how, how long ago, and then uh, uh, um, you estimate this uh, the chance of uh, of uh, a good a good uh, response to treatment. 
And I think in regard with a decompressed craniectomy, you have to have really good arguments to do this in the elderly patient because, um, first of all, I think it's really rare because elderly patients more often have, of course, a trophic brain that, well, there needs to be a very, very high energy injury for uh, that kind of contusion to swell that much that uh, that there is uh, there can be a good outcome. So. I think there's almost never a good indication for like, let's say a person, a, a, a high energy trauma in a, 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 a patient of 80 years old or so. But you form a hypothesis and that you, and, 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 and that's something else I'm throwing a coin, I think. Uh, I guess that uh, what really means is that uh, uh, maybe we don't have uh, enough information or enough pronostic models or enough I mean, you've, you, you, you've gone through the decision process, which is really what uh, we all do, I think, regarding the, the, the functional status of the patient, the, real, the, real, the frailty, the comorbidities, the kind of lesion a patient has. But at the end, uh, you, you have to weigh that towards the risks of your surgery. So maybe we could, we could um, uh, in, in this section, I think we have, they are really a role uh, in order to, to in increase the knowledge in these subjects. And, and I think this, this webinar shows that young people are very worried about elderly people. And that's a, a great sign that we have a really good science to, to come. Um, and, and I feel that um, uh, in, this, uh, in this kind of, uh, I mean, sensitive AI was a, good, uh, a, a very good study regarding the, the, the joint efforts of uh, lots of people. And maybe uh, joining together in, in these efforts could be a, a way of, of getting more information, getting more uh, patients that at the end, we need to, to get new prognostic models for this uh, population. So I, I really am thankful for, for all of you who have uh, um, uh, done a, a terrific job with your presentations. And I think the webinar has been really good. And, and, uh, and especially to Alex, who has been fighting <laughs> all the evening, <laughs> but, but you've managed very well. So, uh, <laughs> so really an example for, for, for everybody. And, and we, we will see each other again very soon. So thank you so much. And we are now saying bye-bye to our, to our attendees. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.